Okay, you ready? Yeah. Actually, when you introduce me, say, and you are, because I want to introduce myself as Rusty Cage today. Uh, Cause okay. Because, or, yeah, because we're talking about a kid's, kid's show. So okay, I'm, I'm going to leave this part in so then it's especially funny when I <laughs> ignore your request and do my own joke. When I come out, could you introduce me as Cager? <laughs> yeah, what, what, is, what you think of fucking uh, Murray over here gonna do your fucking little intro bit? Fuck that, you Joker bitch! I know what you're planning. Gonna shoot my ass in the head. I'll introduce you however the fuck I want, you Kino fucking bitch. Fine, do what you want. I'm still gonna shoot you in the head. Uh, sh- <laughs> okay, shut the fuck up. You guys ready? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Hey everybody, welcome back to your favorite movie review podcast. That's right, is it Kino? And today we've got some big red Kino for you. That's right, the one and only Clifford the Big Red Kino coming at you. Today I am joined by my usual two co-hosts on this program, Emily and Elizabeth. Um, I know they call me Food Stamp, but you know we stack up those big bags, and I'm not talking full of cans. Oh, but we are the mans. Yeah, buddy. Now, Kino Corner, you, before the show, told me to introduce you as Joker, and now I did something else. How do you feel? You about to go all uh, monkey mode on me? I'm gonna see a chimp out? Well, I I was, no, I was gonna say that, um, I can show you something, uh, I can show you something big and red, and his name is Clifford the Big Red Dog. Now, do you think if uh, Rusty Cage was the composer for the film, it, do you think maybe in the scene when uh, Emily Elizabeth wakes up in bed next to a dog that is as big as like a whole house, uh, do you think Rusty might have included a song that has to do with perhaps um, a certain gender and race of uh, human beings and their relationship <laughs> with canines? <laughs> I was I was thinking that, and actually, you know, it's good that we're talking about Rusty Cage this early on because I think that uh, an Izakino talking about a literal children's film will probably <laughs> attract half of his audience. Yeah, that's, more than half. You think there's a big crossover audience between Rusty Cage <laughs> fans and Clifford the Big Red Dog live action Paramount Plus? I, I don't think. Well, <laughs> actually, you know what? Interestingly enough, uh, I think that you probably aren't approaching this from the same angle that I am, but I do think, actually, that Rusty Cage's audience would take to this film for uh, certain reasons, and that's why my thesis that I put together after I watched the film recently, I called it Clifford the Big Red Pill, and I was drawing a lot of analogies <laughs> Uh, to the, all the patriots out there, I think that Clifford really was sort of a sleeper for the, all the patriots to really enjoy, and I think Rusty would certainly fall into that category. Well, I would love to hear all these conspiracy theories about how red pilling the movie is. Uh, right before we get into that, Kino, I know you keep your your nose up in those Hollywood uh, box office numbers and papers and all that grind. Is this Clifford movie successful? Like, did it come out in theaters? What is the tomato meter? What are the details on this film? So, I'm going to go to a website called The Numbers right okay. now. Okay. The Numbers.com. The Numbers don't lie. Clifford the Big Red Dog, it says total gross um, this weekend was $22 million, uh $22 million. Against right, the budget let's... of how much? Because I'm dying to know the budget of this film. Yeah, I want to know the budget of it too. And you also have to say like, so that's, you know, how many people watched on Paramount Plus? Because I watched it on, on Paramount Plus. I got like a free month. Oh, is that whatever. what you call Pirate Bay in your house? <laughs> <laughs> so it has a, a 55 on Metacritic, which puts it a little bit above um, Eternals. Oh, wow. <laughs> Which is sitting at a 52 right now. Uh, I'm not seeing the budget for it. Let me see here. Um, budget for Clifford. Let's see, because they didn't. Oh, it says 64 million dollars. That's what wow. Google's telling me. Wow. So box office of 22 million. But how many people are watching on Paramount Plus? I know a lot of people are, so you have to see what Paramount's numbers are. That's crazy to me because I think the most obvious thing anybody would have to say about this movie is that it looks incredibly cheap and the Clifford CGI looks so terribly fake 
that the movie's just impossible to uh, accept as reality. You, there's no shot in the film where I accept it for what it is presenting they sh- me. They should have made it. So I'm gonna like they should have made it animated. Like the whole thing just should have been an animated film. But I know yeah. animated films are like way more expensive, and it might have been a budget thing. Uh, Because I remember someone, like, noting how Fantastic Mr. Fox is a pretty cheap animated movie, and that was, like, a $30 million budget. Um, Well, you see, the thing of it is, is that, I mean, I would concur that, you know, uh, I mean, yeah, Clifford, there's really no uh, believing that Clifford is a real dog. I almost thought at first at the beginning that maybe they could have actually just... uh, you know, like, chroma keyed one of the dog's fur and just, like, had an actual dog and be red when he was, like, the same size as the other real dogs. But then they had to, like, have him making all these, you know, unusual facial expressions that normal dogs couldn't do. So I'm like, okay, okay. Yeah, I but, think, um, if anything, certain points it, either where, a chroma you know, key a real dog or do what the Tom and Jerry movie did where Tom and Jerry are just their cartoon selves. And yeah. they, you know, like, they Although, did... Although, to be fair... To be fair, I was like, I was able to watch all of Clifford and and be like, yeah, this, you know, as a movie, it's like your typical sort of 90s kind of family drunk comedy, whatever. But with Tom and Jerry, I couldn't make it 10 minutes in. And I was on an airplane where there was like literally nothing else to watch. And I just opted to not watch anything after watching 10 minutes of Tom and Jerry, so... I mean, at least the Tom and Jerry movie had cartoon violence and an attempt at humor. This movie was so milk toast and so by the numbers and generic and didn't even play with the concept of having a literal giant dog in New York City. The movie opts out of having dog-related humor and replaces it with three car chase scenes? In this movie about a giant dog in a city, they have three of the most generic action scenes a movie could possibly have. Three fucking car chases. Uh, If I'm going to make a Clifford movie, I'm going to think of as many sight gags and uh, wacky hijinks that would involve a giant dog in a city and not the most generic fucking action bullshit I can throw into this kid's movie for $64 million. You fucking kidding me? I had to give it. I had to give it three stars on Letterbox for this reason. You're alone. disgusting. I had to give it three stars on Letterbox for this reason alone. There is a subplot of sending Clifford to China, right? Like they said, and they saying, "Oh yeah, he's gonna be safe." And I'm thinking, "No, he's not. <laughs> he's listen, going to okay. China. <laughs> so you might, You're so sending listen, a dog to a, China." <laughs> This, that whole part of it is actually very, it's a whole other red pill too. I put this in my notes for why I call this Clifford the big red pill. So basically, yeah, so Clifford, you know, they have the dog and uh, they're, they're hiding him out from the uh, antagonist of the film, which is a GMO company. Okay, they're, see, they're, they're growing goats with mm. two heads. They're making animals go crazy. Once again, hey, guess what? It's literally real. All right, anyway. Well, okay, so if I could comment on that, I I do appreciate that angle of the animal experimentation and all that, but like Kino was saying, oh, this is a throwback to those classic 90s kids movies, but just because you're doing that doesn't mean the bad guy has to be an evil CEO. It's every single one of these movies. It's like, oh, we got to do the bikini car wash because there's the evil businessman trying to take over the city. Oh, there's the evil businessman trying to steal our big red dog. That's really the best antagonist they could possibly come up with. I would honestly, I would honestly like one of these kids' movies not to just like not have an antagonist. You know, like I the antagonist should have been. You have a giant dog in New York City. That's the antagonist. You don't need a twirling mustache fucking uh, evil man. You're trying to take care of this dog in a in a city. That's the movie. I mean, that's I mean, I think that it did leave them open, you know, at the end everything gets very, you know, they're accepting of the dog, they build in the giant dog house and everybody's like happy rainbow smiles. Yeah. So I think they did leave themselves open to a sequel on that note, but I want to finish my thought on the Chinese thing. Right, because, right. So this guy they bring the dog in and you know they show the these living the the young asian kid that goes to school with the girl who's the main character you know they bring him in and uh, they're living in the lap luxury he comes in he's speaking chinese and they're like oh yeah my dad owns this entire apartment complex as a chinese national you know they kind of gloss over that but there's oh, a chinese yeah. national owning a billion dollar property in new york city anyway 
He comes in, he's talking on his cell phone, talking and speaking in Chinese. He goes, oh, I got a freight going overseas, leaving for Hong Kong tonight. We're going to smuggle him over. I'm thinking to myself, oh, so there's a multi-billionaire Chinese national owning property in New York City <laughs> who's letting freights come in and out of the, the bay with whatever he wants going in or out, and it's not getting Without checked. Obviously, the, Weird obviously, mutated the, giant the dog dogs. does, uh, you know, if Clifford ends up jumping off the boat, so then they're like, oh, something's going on. You know, it, it alerts people. But I think that's another one of the secret red pills in this movie. They're making social commentary that basically there's people, you know, and there's a lot of money getting put up, and they'll do whatever they want. They're bringing this in and this out, uh, and who knows what they're bringing in and out for their own financial gain. They're saying he's got hundreds of acres over in China and he's got it loaded up with all kinds of exotic animals. Is this some kind of retreat? Is this just his private property that he just happens to have full of exotic wildlife? Is he making money over there on this? You know, they're, they're, it glosses over a lot of this, but I was very perceptive. I'm like, you know, once they started dropping a couple little crumbs of red pills here and there, I was just soaking it up like a, like a vacuum and a sponge combined into one creature. Anyways, yeah. yeah, my theory on yeah. the the Asian billionaire, my interpretation was this was uh, this universe's version of Andrew Yang because he's a Asian billionaire in New York. He's a neglectful father. His son is just <laughs> running through the streets, not and his being son's autistic. Yeah, autistic son. But uh, <laughs> I think your theory might be better if he if they did say he's a Chinese national in the movie. I don't know why they would mention that, but I might have missed a a few uh, few. Well, I'm just saying, I mean, he could be an American citizen, all right? They didn't make the distinction exactly, but he also owns, he owns hundreds of acres of, of land in China. Maybe he has the... people on call to ship ships back and forth of product without being checked. The implication could so, be that Andrew saying. Yang is a Chinese na nationalist who's going undercover in our politics. So maybe the movie is, is even more red-pilled than we thought. Hey, this no, is yeah. a hit piece on Yang. I think when was this uh, movie filmed? I mean, nobody party. had masks on, so this might have been 2019. They might have, they might have still been. Uh, yeah, yeah, when did they film this? You know, I, it still could have been in the mix at the time. Uh, yeah, so I think, I think that you're, you're. Uh, I think all these theories are holding weight. I think there was a lot bubbling under the surface here, which is why, you know, the big red pill. You know, what I'm saying. But anyhow, <laughs> when did they, when did they film this? Because this has been like pushed back and pushed back and back and back and back well, for a long time. Based on the quality of the CGI, I was assuming they filmed this last week. Because <laughs> if um, they had all of COVID to do the Clifford CGI, they really wasted their time. Yeah. Um, okay. So Paramount Pictures got the rights in 2016. But uh, um, I'm trying to... I don't know when this was. I don't know when this. Principal was photography began June tenth, two thousand nineteen, and wrapped August twenty third, two thousand nineteen. So Andrew Yang, I don't know. He probably dropped out by then, but I don't know. But there still could have been some Yang gang momentum at this time. I think time, there was a Yang gang momentum at that time. Yeah. You think that? Um, do you think that like Clifford the Big Red Dog is not actually real, and it's just her being gang stalked throughout the city? <laughs> Well, I thought that another theory of mine was that, you know, uh, Clifford, the big red dog, was actually uh, uh, meant to represent the spirit of American patriotism. Because, listen, you got a girl, she worked very hard, she's the only one in her prestigious private school that didn't just outright pay. She's a hard worker, she went up, picked up cans off the street to get some money, you know, it's going on tough times, and she's going through hard times, but then something comes into her life and that feels her pain. And it grows magically, and it starts to, you know, help her get the confidence to stand up for herself against all these bourgeoisie that just have everything handed to them. You know, she gets some self-confidence. She's feeling more powerful, more strong than these corrupt government entities, which have been poisoning food and water, you know, see that there's this dog that they could try to harness for their own financial gain. And there's a struggle that takes place, uh, you know... <clears throat> I'm kind of getting a little bit off the rails here, but I think if you watch the film with this in mind, you know, that there's certain things that this could really work as as a thing. You know, the, the dog, uh, the, there's a big neighborhood aspect in this film that Clifford sort of uh, brings the neighborhood together despite all their differences, their different walks of life, they're pretty much old and young, 
They're from every background you could imagine, but through their unified love of Clifford and and their support of Clifford, it brings them all together to fight and stand against this corrupt entity. Uh, I think that there's some parallels here, but uh, I gotta tell you, the movie was certainly better than I was expecting uh, when I was watching it from the angle that I was perceiving it at anyway. I went into it thinking that it was going to be like Tom and Jerry. And as I said, I was watching Tom and Jerry on the airplane and I couldn't even make it 10 minutes in. And it was just so bad that I had to turn it off. I so, mean, I'm flabbergasted to hear this because I would say the Tom and Jerry movie is leagues above this film. This movie was utter dog water, pun intended. Complete trash. I got nothing out of this movie but contempt and hatred. Tom and Jerry, <laughs> I also did not finish it, but I made it very close to the end. <laughs> I couldn't make it 10 minutes in. And I, I guess it was just too in my face bad. Um... Whereas Clifford was just more like, oh, this is like a, I don't know, like this is like one of those 90s, I, I don't know, like it's like Flubber or something like that. Well, Tom like and that. Jerry, like, it had uh, that funny Mexican guy and he was making some jokes. Like this movie, I don't know what- Carlos Mencia? One of them, they're all, uh, never mind. But <laughs> what in this movie hooked you in? Was it the, the homeless guy who lives in his van? Who well, actually, ironically you know, probably has guy. more uh, living space than a New York apartment renter? I yeah, say, I, I, um, I also like yeah. all those tropes that are kind of from those like 90s movies, right? Where it's like, they're talking about living in a rent-controlled flat, and they have this huge apartment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, gosh, that's a humongous apartment for New York, and you're talking about being poor. Uh, okay, and then yeah, and he's living in a UPS truck uh, that's bigger than probably a lot of people's. Like, like you think about, I remember that video from earlier that I think it was earlier this year where uh, somebody was like showing what their living situation like was it was like in New York and they had like 10 roommates mm -hmm. it's like yeah this guy like sleeps under the stairs this guy sleeps on the couch this cup like that's how it is like living in New York yeah so this guy sleeping money. in a giant mobile truck I mean he's living the life in New York that would that square footage would cost you two grand and yeah. he, he has it for free and they, they dare to impose on his lifestyle like he's not living large and in charge. That was a true yeah. Sigma male moment. And yeah, and he jokes and he's like, this is a this is a good financial uh, decision. And it the it truth genuinely is. is. That it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that guy was pretty cool. I think that him uh, being very relatable to me as a man who's very irresponsible and kind of just uh, you know floats around the, uh, the the world. Much more successful uh, siblings. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> true. Yeah, no, yeah, he, uh, he, he was he, the hook. He was the hook for me. He was the character right. I was rooting for the whole time. And was, you know what? Yeah. Um, the fact so at the beginning when he's sleeping in this truck and this the, the police lady or like the traffic ticket officer. I don't, I don't live in New York City. I know they got different. They got more police officers that, that do different things over there. But she's basically knocking on his van like, "Hey, you bum! You know you can't be doing this." And he put a trash bag over the meter that said "broken" on it, which she <laughs> saw through that. But I'm like, actually, that's a pretty good idea. I should definitely keep that in mind. I'll probably do that in the future. Anyway, <laughs> but the more important thing is is that uh, towards the climax of the film, you know, he basically, uh, he gets on TV and he's like, hey, yeah, the evil corporation is trying to steal Clifford and say he's theirs, but he's our dog. And it cuts to like this shot <clears throat> where the police officer, she's like standing downtown in Times Square and like watching all these screens of him like, he's like, yeah, my ninth grade teacher said I'd never be anything, but guess what, I'm on TV. And she's like, uh, it, it does this shot that is, doing like a 360 shot around her and she's like melting down in her, <laughs> like in, in a romantic way in yeah. Times Square. She's like, oh my God, it's the guy I kicked out of his van a couple days ago. He's on TV now. He's so hot. I think he's Chad now. And I'm like, that's right. See, that's, that's, that's all it takes Clouds, for a bum to go on make TV. Him go. If you're a bum, he probably just get pulled on his, TV. Yeah, he's pulling his yeah. truck back over there to go back to bed tonight. And she's going to be, she's not going to take him. She's going to be watching over. She's going to be protecting that van. You know, you got to be the alpha male sometimes, and you know what? He proved himself, and now he's got it on lock. Yeah, that's true. And uh, it was a very Sigma moment to, sh to shout out all the people that, you know, said that he would never amount to anything, even yeah. though he hadn't really done anything. 
That's right. Well, <laughs> use, uh, does, use that cover, uh, does that cover all of the sure red pilled moments? Your enemies? Or, Egg, is there more to this uh, Clifford the Big Red Pill theory that you have going on? Or are there any other secrets of the film that I missed? Well, other than the gang stalking. Like, well, yeah, uh, so I, I, I made a note of that um, as I was just starting to watch the film. But so there's a point uh, towards the beginning of the film, I think right before uh, yeah, you Clifford in the server. makes his puppy appearance. But yeah, there's... Um, so 4K, she, she brings her bag of, of cans to the school and, and they're like, for the fundraiser, this fundraiser, I guess, you know, we are in an aluminum shortage. So I guess they predicted that too. Oh, red pill. Anyway... <laughs> So she brings these cans in, and they're like, "Oh my God, you, di you dirty, filthy piece of garbage! Uh, we just write checks for the fundraiser. Nobody actually brings cans in, but then she brings the cans in, and the bag like tears open, and everyone's like, oh, look at the loser! Ha <laughs> ha!' And then it cuts to, she's like in bed, and she has her laptop open on her desk, and it's like Instagram. It's like going viral on Instagram, like this footage of her bag it's, breaking no, open and, and get this it's not like cell phone footage it's footage from the it's literally camera. exactly what you just saw on the screen <laughs> yeah. it's literally like a cinematic angle from the back of the room and it's it's with recording the, before the bag nice rips open cinema camera. so what the hell is going on here what kind of like <laughs> and uh, how it's who was filming how did they know well, the, the moment was so how many embarrassing of sabotage were we on here, it was so you know? embarrassing Something that god himself came down and filmed it with his camera <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty sure too that the the color of the cans changes because when she when the cans all fall out of her bag they're pretty much like all the same color they look oh all my like god call fucking can. cinema sins dude i'll get mauler on it that's right <laughs> yeah that's and the kind of analysis another i wanted to come into this film with when she's eating, eating her honeycomb uh, cereal at the beginning, the uh, placement of the cereal box changes. Oh the my shots. fucking god! <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and Back to the Future when Marty explodes himself with the loudspeaker and all the bookshelf falls on him, the trash is different in the different shot. Hello, sheeple, wake up! <laughs> <laughs> That, that's two sins. That's right. Well, I'm just Ding. Guess, I'll, I'll be fair. I'll be fair <laughs> here. Um, I knew there probably wasn't going to be a lot to really chew on this film if I didn't come into it with a very open mind and really interpreting every single second of the footage with the utmost scrutiny. So I probably am a little bit in the wrong here. I probably am just a little bit schizo about the whole thing. <laughs> and it probably is just meant to be a nice, heartwarming family fun film where uh, a girl gets bullied her dog makes her feel better and then bad guy tries to do bad thing to dog but then dog make bad guy go away and everybody happy yeah no so, I, I don't so care what it was meant to be, I, to be. I, I don't care about interpretations <laughs> i care about reality and the reality is this movie was so lazily made it was clearly nobody's passion project i mean oh man hollywood people made a movie for money and nothing else i get it but I think the reason why I detest the movie is because it's very rare that I genuinely feel as though I could have done a better job. And when it comes to the screenplay of this, I, as somebody who is not even a Clifford fan, I genuinely believe like me and Kino Corner in a weekend could give you a better 80 minute Clifford script. Literally all you need to do is watch every episode of the source material, read the books, uh, watch every episode of the cartoon, and every single time there's anything at all that is slightly funny or slightly clever, just write it down, and then after you're done with your binge, you just take all the best ideas they've ever had and you cram it into the 80 minute movie. And that's how easy it would fucking be. And you don't have to do three car chases that are generic and not interesting and overall forgettable. You don't have well, to do the, yeah. the evil CEO. And it shouldn't have been in New York, like because Clifford doesn't take place. The the show I, I watched the show all the time as a kid, and it does not take place in New York. Is it just a random it. city? No, it's like a smaller town that's supposed to be on like an island, supposedly in New England. Um, okay. Yeah, so it's supposed to be a more pastoral setting, I guess you could say. Well, Kino, do you um, agree? Do you think we could have cranked out a better screenplay? Yeah, I mean, the screenplay is very by the numbers. It's like, it's, so it's so terrible, it made me mad. <laughs> I mean, this, as I said, well, well, what they did... Okay, so this is what they did for this screenplay. Um, they did not 
they they binged stuff, but they weren't binging Clifford. They were binging all the like the sort of uh, uh, TV movie family comedies from the '90s, and because it feels like that, like you could have something else that's not Clifford in it, and uh, you could have anything else that's not Clifford in it. You know, like it's just another well, weird in, thing. in the fucking cartoon. Doesn't Clifford speak? He talks yeah, to the other dogs in English. He yeah. has, like, he's the titular character, and in the cartoon, he actually has autonomy. He makes decisions, he has opinions, he speaks, he makes plans and acts on them. The Clifford in this movie is not even a character. It's completely a plot device. It's a big, crazy dog, gotta chase it through New York. It doesn't make any decisions, it's just... It's pissing on trees, and the piss is <laughs> it's like a fucking hydro pump from Blastoise and blast fucking people with piss in the face and then <laughs> fall yeah. over. It, disgusting. That's the best joke they came up with, was that a giant dog has a huge piss stream. That's the best they could do with the Clifford concept. Yeah, and then you, they don't even touch on uh, him taking a dump. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, this is New York City we're talking about after all. They're used yeah. to giants, you know, three yeah. foot tall piles of yeah, shit everywhere. He, <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he fit in with everyone else in the subway. Yeah, and then when Clifford went to India, they worshipped, worshipped him like a god. He fit in so perfectly. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think, I I mean, I think we definitely could. It's not like it's some very terribly hard concept to, uh, you know, to wrap your head around. It's not like we're trying to, re you know, to to make the next, uh, uh, you know, great, you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey here. It's like you're trying to make a children's film based off of Clifford. There's already tons of source material, tons of stuff to draw from. And for a movie like Clifford, where it hasn't really been, um, not a lot of media has been made of it as of late. At least I don't think so. You know, I remember watching it as a kid back in the late '90s, early 2000s, but I, I don't know how much has been made since then. But I would think that to bring it into the film world again and to maybe introduce it as its own sort of like, okay, we're starting up a series, a film series about Clifford. I think that maybe the best thing to do isn't necessarily what they did um but is to is to really kind of base it in the other stuff to bring in the you know into what's come before to bring in fans of the original series and books and to kind of introduce it the clifford that we all grew up with at least um introduce it to the new generation because that's what they're trying to do is you know introducing this character to the new generation but it's not the same character no it's not a character at all that they took Clifford's autonomy away from him, and he's just, he's nothing. He's really the villain of the movie, in a way. They should have just, like, they should have just made it fully animated. Yeah. And then, if they made it fully animated, then... Honestly, you know, they yeah, if they had made it fully more. animated, and, uh, like, stuck with the original 2D style, this might have actually been a pretty good movie. It might have actually had the charm, and everything like that, but instead you have just, uh... Yeah, the mutant dog uh, trying to be taken <laughs> by the government to grow more giant chicken eggs. Or well, I mean, they say that Life Grow, you know, is an independent company, but obviously we see them bribing <laughs> people with money. So they probably got they probably got some uh, people up. They're, they're bribing the politicians and everything. But <clears throat> yeah, it, it was. Uh, it might have been better than Eternals. I guess the uh, the critic reviews <laughs> looked like that. Uh, Didn't but, you say the Eternals was surprisingly good? Now you're saying Clifford was better. <laughs> well, I mean, it was surprisingly good, but as I was watching Clifford from my own schizophrenic viewpoint, yeah. that you know, Clifford was sort of a uh, representation of the American consciousness versus foreign intervention <laughs> on American property, corporate greed, uh, political corruption, and so forth. You know, that really enhanced my viewing of the film, I will suppose. But Should I guess we... if I was a child, uh, if I was a child, let's say if, if I was tw 20 years ago, I probably would have still preferred Eternals because it has people punching each other and stuff. Um, and Clifford is just, you know, he's... Uh, one thing about the Clifford, I will say, you know, he's, uh, when he's knocking over tables and stuff, that was pretty cool. Uh, you know. Yeah, so I for, liked for it all when the he fake was like, I liked it when CGI, he was destroying stuff. He did knock over <laughs> tables pretty good. He did, uh, knock over expensive, uh, pottery and things, and so the destruction, even if the CGI 
of him uh, was pretty implausible and looked quite fake. Uh, my the, favorite the breaking things was pretty real sounding, so yeah. that was pretty cool. No, my favorite, my favorite shot, my favorite scene in Clifford was when uh, the superintendent was in there, and they were trying to hide Clifford from him, and Clifford was being a a big old retard, you know, wanting <laughs> to run around the whole place, and it set it up because the superintendent thought that um, Jack Whitehall smelled like a dog and he was like no this is just my man scent very that's a very sigma grind set sort of attitude to not wearing deodorant uh, and he's like I just like like to smell my natural odors and he said maybe we can smell each other and see this was actually kind of genius because it was setting it up for a joke because just a couple minutes later uh, when the superintendent is trying to fix the pipe and you see his butt crack and Clifford goes up behind him and sniffs his butt to, to basically cover for Clifford, Jack Whitehall moves Clifford over and then stands behind the superintendent implying that he was sniffing his butt. And... <laughs> That one really uh, had you slapping. <laughs> that your one knees. really got me. He, he's bent over in pain. <laughs> he's bent. I was I was bent over in pain, laughing my ass off. Pun intended. That this British guy was sniffing a black guy's butt, and he is British. Should oh, we? I he was uh, from New York City. Should we m- mention the John Cleese in the room? Oh yeah, <laughs> John Cleese is in this movie surprisingly making zero racist jokes, which goes against <laughs> everything he's been promoting on Twitter. Have you seen this, Aggie? Yeah. He's super liberal, and then he's like, "Oh, but I'm against uh, cancel culture." And then he posted that. You want to read that joke? Um, the joke he posts. He says, "Okay, here's the only type of humor you're allowed to tell in 2021." A guy walks into a bar and says, I'm not racist. The bartender says, I'm not racist either. Oh, good. And and John Cleese is implying that the joke would have been better if one of them was a racist, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, he's correct because the joke wasn't yeah. funny, but... Yeah. I think there's other types of humor. Clearly, he went into this Clifford movie knowing that wholesome humor was achievable because I do not recall him saying, I haven't seen such a big red ugly thing since uh, the days of the pilgrims. Like, I, I was expecting at least some sort of racist <laughs> joke from him, but no. He really didn't Maybe do that's anything. And I guess cut. I didn't quite pay attention, but I know they're, uh, I mean, I kind of did. It was just a little difficult for me to see, but. Uh, I didn't like try to zoom in on it or anything like that. He uh, visits towards the end of the film. Uh, John Cleese's character uh, visits. There's a little bit of confusion, but it kind of clears itself up uh, by the end of the movie. He visits a, an old friend of his who is dying in his hospital from some terminal illness. And I think that the man may may have been African American. I wasn't entirely sure, but they kind of show him just for like a split second there, and then they. Uh, they, they start, this character start cheering because they're like, oh, that means that John Cleese is still alive. Oh, but I guess we shouldn't be cheering because this guy just died. So then that's kind of weird, I guess. Maybe maybe John Cleese wrote that part that they're like accidentally cheering for the death of a black man. But anyway, <laughs> I guess I don't oh, know. Yeah. They, they only show the guy's picture part. for like a second. So anyways. Uh, yeah. John Cleese definitely uh, wrote that part. <laughs> and I'm just excited for the director's cut, which is just where his character is complete racist. They just cut all that stuff out for the initial uh, release of the film. And they're waiting until the Blu-ray Criterion uh, release for all the uh, real Kino files out there to enjoy John Cleese's uh, racist uh, rants. They're going to have just... uh, a spin-off <laughs> where, um, you remember that Hank Hill, uh, the King of the Hill episode where Hank Hill's dog like attacks the, uh, the, the uh, plumber of color or whatever. I think he was a plumber, right? And then they yeah. say that his dog is racist. I think John Cleese should have like a 10-minute uh, spin-off episode on the, on the <laughs> DVD where like he's like walking around and he's like, Oh, Clifford, let's go down to the deli today and enjoy a delicious sandwich. And, like, they walk in. <laughs> hey there, Mr. Cleese, what do you have? Uh, pastrami on rye? Yes, I think that sounds quite delightful. And then uh, the black lawyer guy comes in. He's like, well, hi there, everybody. I'm here today to get myself some lunch as well. Clifford just starts, like, foaming at the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out that he accidentally, uh, he, he had just walked through some, like, some kind of bush or something that Clifford was allergic to, and he, that's why he started foaming at the mouth. Yeah, see, to be honest, uh, 
I think I just wrote a better movie than this entire film. Well, and so that just goes to show that we're better than uh, the movie you know, did we... show that the police are unable to apprehend Clifford. What if in the sequel the police actually get Clifford on their side and they do train him to be racist? So then the police are employing <laughs> a giant mutant red dog to go like attack and kill black what? people in New York. That could be a better Clifford movie. I actually have an idea for a better Clifford movie, right? Okay. So Clifford, so we can say it's going to be Clifford 2, the, the, the squeakle, okay? Where Cl Clifford sees another, like, maybe not big red dog, but maybe like big blue dog or big yellow dog or something like that. And they start a dog fighting club and it's essentially fight club, but with Clifford, but it's all about dog fighting. And I think that that would be really interesting. I think they've and done that before. How about a sequel where, so Clifford, he gets to be like, you know, he's already got the Instagram popularity and now they're like accepting him. So he's probably going to get like 10 million followers on Instagram by the sequel. And he starts grooming minors on Discord. <laughs> 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 hey, Clifford, you're following a lot of white women lately. You want to explain that? Well, I mean, he is a dog. I think he can start a grooming business. It'd probably be appropriate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clifford, uh, but it, uh, the, the Clifford sequel might be where he, he bites somebody. Uh, in a fit of rage, and then the the city wants to put him down, and Emily has to uh, fight the city and get him out of the city because uh, they want to put him down. I think that could be a good movie, good ch children's film. It, you know, it'll I teach them if your John dog Cleese... bites somebody, he's gonna get put down. I just hope that John Cleese, a confirmed subscriber to this YouTube channel, of course. Uh, I hope he's listening right now and writing down these ideas because he could really steal these from us and make a lot of money probably to help fund his uh, <laughs> anti-cancel culture show or whatever he's doing right now. Yeah, so I guess our final notes for improving the movie. John Cleese should have been more racist. <laughs> Clifford should have killed more people. <laughs> um, and what was the other major note? Uh, I guess just more racist jokes all around. <laughs> yeah, and, and there should have been a euthanasia subplot. Yeah, they should have been a little more clear about the Andrew Yang uh, Chinese conspiracy subplot. Yeah. It was a yeah, little too vague. <laughs> John Cleese wrote it when the when the <laughs> when Owen, the little Chinese kid, sees Clipper for the big red time, he starts salivating. That's that literally <laughs> did happen in the film. <laughs> yeah, he gets he gets covered in saliva. We just couldn't see it because Clifford's spit was all over him. Well, I think we should now go around the horn and say whether or not we thought the movie was Kino and if we would recommend it. And I'm going to start off by saying it was not Kino. I would not recommend it to anybody for any reason. It's not even so bad that it's good. I would not even show this to a child. There are a million better movies to show them. Uh, I, I would just sh show them the Clifford cartoon, to be honest. I don't know what they would get out of this. All right, I'll go. Um, I don't think it's Kino. Um, but I'm not quite as against it as, as Monkey. Look, if your child is watching something like Coco Melon, uh, it's probably better to have them watch the Clifford movie. Uh, but yeah, I would agree that if you want to get your child no Clifford, uh, the, this movie probably isn't it. Um, that the show is, is definitely like, it's definitely a lot better and has, you know, more messages and things like that. It's probably better to show your kids, but, uh, I didn't think the movie was that bad. I didn't think it was that good. I honestly just thought it was kind of meh, which was better than I expected it to be. So I was pleasantly surprised, but I wouldn't say it's Kino. All right. Yeah, I would say that if you're watching it at face value, as it's probably supposed to be, because it's probably supposed to be watched like five-year-olds and stuff like that, uh, it's completely average, completely run-of-the-mill, in my opinion, you know, as any other thing that gets churned out of the uh, movie mill directed towards children I mean there's nothing offensive about it so that is yeah you could have it play uh, for in your kids room or whatever while you pass out on the couch and hope they fall asleep to it uh, so it's not exactly Kino with that being said because you need a little something to make it Kino but if you do watch it from my schizophrenic viewpoint where Clifford represents American patriotism, there's Chinese nationals taking over uh, the, through financial means, the government's corrupt, the GMO lab is trying to poison the food and water, and they're doing all these uh, satanic experiments on, on animals. If you watch from that viewpoint, then you might enjoy it a little more. But we're going to keep it face value. We're not adding the add-ons, the plug-ins, the extras. Going to have to say not Kino. Speaking of things that uh, were rejected Kino, 
Behind the scenes, Kino, we were doing a little experiment with you and your <laughs> Tinder account. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, actually, during this um, during this uh, podcast, I actually got message back from another girl. So I'll read uh, what I wrote to her. Um, so I made a Tinder account to try to get somebody to watch Clifford the Big Red Dog with me. Um, and I was unsuccessful. Uh, oh, really? So I, I, t- <laughs> I texted this one girl t- today. I said, do you want to see something big and red? <laughs> Clifford the Big Red Dog is now in theaters and warming hearts worldwide. <laughs> and and she, didn't, she, she wasn't into that? She responded, that movie looks like a bad trip waiting to happen. I don't know what that even means, but whatever. Well, um, she's care. clearly and, into you uh, if she responded and didn't say, get the fuck away from me, you pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> so then the other one that I showed the monkey, uh, I opened it up with, you a fan of Clifford the Big Red Dog? I love that big guy. How about we go <laughs> catch the new motion picture based on the beloved character? So... Then she responds to me. She goes, not sure what that entails for me. So I said, is it tails entails supposed nice. to, entails? Is that like a pun? <laughs> yeah. Tails gets trolled. Well, In also because Clifford is, has a tail because he's a dog. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I said this. <laughs> I said, it entails 96 of the most magical minutes in film this year. You'll <laughs> laugh. You'll cry. And you'll get to see that the things that make us unique make us special. Was and this shit really goes, 96 minutes? Yeah, it was, it was 96 yeah, minutes. The oh credit scene was like 10 minutes long. Yeah, though, the credit so. scene was like 7 minutes. So What it was, was the credit like scene? Because I think I turned that off. No, no, it was just credits. It was just rolling credits for literally like 7, seven minutes. Oh. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. the movie should have been so then, 80 minutes. So then she responds with, I'm guessing you've seen it already, which I had. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I watched it right before. Wait, you're and about I to said, deceive this young woman on Tinder? Yeah, and I said, it releases tomorrow, which was true. And then I said, I just can't wait. And then she unmatched me. I, <laughs> bitch. Bitch? <laughs> <laughs> what, is she Clifford's mom? <laughs> oh, yeah, which makes him a son of a bitch. That's right. <laughs> well, it sounds like uh, all three of us enjoyed Clifford, thought it was Kino, probably movie of the year. You guys have any final thoughts? Anything you want to plug? Uh... No, I, I don't think I'm going to plug anything. Kino, where the one. fuck is your podcast? The Kino cast has not been updated in two months. You're worse than the monkey in Big Show. <laughs> yeah, I know. I haven't been updating it because I've been working on my own shit. What, I, what do you mean your busy. own shit? That is your own shit. It's your show. Yeah, no, I know. I actually have like two or three pod, like episodes I still need to upload. That oh, my I just God. Haven't. Yeah. Um, no, no, we've I'm all just, been there. Yeah, I, I'll get around to it. I, I'm going to... Next week is my like uh, um, is my catch up week because I'm off work all next week, so I'm oh, catching shit. up on all this shit. Yeah, so uh, uh, yeah, so I'm doing all my catch up stuff, but uh, um, no, I don't really have anything to plug right now. Well, Aggie, I know you're you got a big NFT gig going on. You want to talk about that? That's right. Uh, yes, I. Uh... In collaboration with StoneTossNFT.com, in about a week from now, he'll be releasing his NFT collection, and then that's he'll also be providing me with my own very special Eggy NFT, which I don't even know how I'm going to go about selling it, but yeah, I mean, uh, however it works, it's going to be going out there, it's going to be going live. Uh, you can follow me on my YouTube channel, Big Yoke. Uh, you can find it in your YouTube by searching hashtag Big Yoke Live in the search bar, and it should pull the channel up. And I'm sure when that, when that comes around, I will definitely make some kind of video detailing the process of how that goes. Because listen, a man's got to eat, bills to pay, salt and so forth. So we'll see what kind of price is going on out there, but it will be going up. And with that, also um, I'll, I'll just be doing some live streams and other videos on the channel as well. So make sure to tune in because we're always booming and grooving. Yes, Sarik. <laughs>